Coming up on Tech News Today, Intel says Windows 8 is not ready, but it's okay. They should put it out anyway. Barnes & Noble has some new nooks that look pretty nice, and 3D printing gets more awesome. We'll have more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, September 26, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ring Central. We do everything in the cloud. That's why I love our cloud based phone system by Ring Central. Zero startup costs, and Ring Central is $20 a month per user. Try it now with a 30 day risk free trial. Buy one desk phone and get a second phone free up to 20 phones. Call 800 543 9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. And by FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing app for small business that saves time and gets you paid faster. Join over 3.5 million FreshBooks users and try the service free for 30 days of unlimited use at FreshBooks.com. Be sure to let them know you heard about it on Tech News Today. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphone. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at Gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Owl. And this is the show where we try to keep you up to date on the top stories in the tech world, starting each day with the top 10 in the news feed. Yes. Dramatic Chipmunk is dramatic over the new Barnes & Noble stuff. Looks like uh, there's some new gear you'll be able to try out that new Barnes & Noble video store on, new Nook tablets. The Nook HD is a 7-inch tablet with a 1440 by 900 display and either 8 or 16 gigabytes of storage. The Nook HD Plus is a 9-inch tablet, sound familiar, bigger <laughs> tablet, with a 1920 by 1280 display and 16 and 32 gigabyte options. You can pre-order both of them now, and they should hit stores shelves in early November, ranging from $199 to $299 US, depending on size and storage. Intel CEO Paul Odolini told employees at an event in Taiwan that Windows 8 is being released before it's fully ready, but that it's the right move since Microsoft can make improvements to the software after it ships. But not everybody sees it that way. Some analysts with fresh memories of the Vista launch back in 2007 say the level of bugs and fine-tuning yet to be done on the current OS are troubling. Earlier this month, Intel announced that it's cutting third-quarter revenue forecasts, but that no layoffs are necessary and the market will grow in 2013. Maybe it's just nervous. Maybe he just means it's not quite ready. It's it's well, he says some confidence. Just, they need to buy the PCs so that Intel's forecast buy is better. Buy some PCs, people. Yeah, it's all going to be good. You know, we haven't talked about the, uh, about Apple Maps in a really long time, so I want to <laughs> bring that up right now. The Verge reports that Apple ditched Google Maps even though the deal had one year to go before it expired. Google did not expect the move, and the Verge's sources say that caused Google to scramble to create an iOS Maps app, which won't be available for several months. Apple got rid of Ma Google Maps partly because it felt that the iOS version of Maps lagged behind the Android version, particularly the lack of turn-by-turn -turn navigation. So if you're tired of map stories, here's a RAM story cleanser for you. Uh, you may have seen DDR4 RAM in production already, but now it's official. The JEDEC Solid State Technology Association has released the official standard. DDR4's per pin data rate standard is 1.6 gigatransfers per second at the minimum and 3.2 gigatransfers per second at the top end, although the cap is expected to increase as it did with DDR3. Now, if that all sounds like acronym vomit to you, here's the part to really care about. Faster speeds uh, will begin at 2133 megahertz, and battery life will get better as DDR4 operates at lower power. Faster and longer. Good. Yep, there you go. Sounds like good news. Samsung's <laughs> mobile chief, Shin Jong Hyun, says that Google chairman Eric Schmidt is set to meet with Samsung executives in South Korea this week around the launch of the Nexus 7 there in steps to further Google's involvement with Android litigation. This is reported by the Korea Times. Samsung hasn't let that 1 billion U.S. ruling in Apple's favor get it down. It's both in increased its handset sales target to $400 million for 2012 and is attempting to block sales of the iPhone 5 based on alleged infringement of LTE patents. Duck and cover, folks. Ah, ah. Security Explorations has found a flaw in Java that would let someone com take complete control over your PC or Mac. The flaw is present in Java SE 5, 6, and 7. That's the last eight years of Java. Security Exploration says that the flaw puts 1 billion users at risk. 
as the team got the exploit to work on Firefox, Chrome, IE, Opera, and Safari on an up-to-date Windows 7 machine to figure this affects Macs and PCs, actually. The good news is that the flaw was not found to be exploited in the wild yet. Duck and cover. Stop, drop, and roll. Yesterday, California Governor Jerry Brown... Soon I will be. It always reminds me of Jello Biafra. Uh, signed Bill SB 1298 into law, formalizing legal permissions and safety standards for cars to drive themselves, joining other states like Nevada and Florida. Brown signed the bill from Google's Mountain View headquarters, and Sergey Brin, who is never without his Google Glass eyewear, predicted you'll be in a driverless car within five years. He looks like he's in pain <laughs> in that photo. Oh, oh, I have to sign this. Thing. Gotta wear these glasses, they're so heavy. For the audio listeners, it's just a picture of Sergey with his glasses on. <laughs> that Samsung Galaxy S3 vulnerability we talked about earlier this week, fixable with an over-the-air update. Samsung says that users can install an OTA security update that will protect them from the vulnerability that could allow somebody to remotely delete all of their personal data, which would kind of suck. The flaw, first demonstrated last week at a security conference in Argentina, affects Samsung's TouchWiz UI, which allows executed commands on the device's keypad. Most software dialers require users to hit the send button to complete a code, but Samsung software does not. Thankfully... Fixes in. Fixes in. Hey, good news for Intel. TI is getting out of the mobile chip making business. On Tuesday, TI's VP for Embedded Processing, Greg DeLaghi, told investors the consumer market is less attractive going forward, according to Reuters. Uh, while TI's OMAP processors are in the latest Kindles and Nooks, they've been losing ground to Qualcomm and NVIDIA and companies like Apple and Samsung that have designed their own mobile chips. HTC and O2 will sell a, sell a new flagship phone without a charger soon. No charger? That's an outrage, right? That's what everybody's thinking. No, no, it's not an outrage at all. O2 says that 70%, well, maybe partial, 70% of customers who buy phones already have the relevant charger. The HTC phone will ship with a micro USB to USB cable. So even if you don't have a charger, you can probably go get one easily. This is a trial as O2 wants to remove all chargers from phones sold by 2015. Hmm. So it saves them money and they get to look environmental. Yes. Oh, nice. You can be outraged. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Ring Central. Uh, you may have, may have heard this story before, but when we built the studio, uh, we wanted to spend money on making it look good, not spending money running wires for a PBX system in the basement. You don't even know what PBX is. Don't worry about it. It's going out of style uh, because of voice over the internet. And that's why we chose ring central russell our it guy pointed out we could get a cloud-based phone system and just save a ton of money and and more than that a ton of hassle uh it's ring central is zero startup costs no hardware to install or maintain and allows you to easily customize all of your call handling our producers get their voicemail get their in the email uh so when you're checking for messages you're checking for all your messages all at once and you can even get fax messages for those people who insist on sending you faxes. You don't have to figure out, okay, where's the fax machine? How does it work? You just get it right there in your email. Ring Central offers all-inclusive pricing as low as $20 a month per user. And you can start right now with a 30-day risk-free trial. They have a special offer for our listeners. When you buy one desk phone, you get a second phone for free. You can do that up to 20 phones. So call this number. This is the number for TNT listeners, 800-543-9980. That's 800 543 Nine nine eight zero again eight hundred five four three nine nine eight zero or you can also go to ringcentral.com and use promo code twit ringcentral.com promo code twit we thank them for their support of tech news today joining us now to discuss the stories of the day very happy to have natanya baron author and senior editor at wired's geek mom blog how's it going natanya it's going great. How about you? Doing well. Great to have you on. Uh, we I haven't talked to you I don't think since forecast when we had you on as a guest there. That's true. Yeah, it was a while ago. That was that was fun. Well, I'm glad uh, you could take the time to join us today, and uh, we got some new Nooks to talk about, don't we? New hardware today. I mean, yesterday Barnes & Noble introduced their uh, Nook video service, and now you have toys to play uh, with soon. The Nook HD 7-inch and the HD Plus, which is a 9-inch, this is a 9.0, not a 8.9, both run a highly skinned versions of Android 4.0 ice cream sandwich. The Nook HD, it's, these prices are, are just crazy low. $199 for 8 gigabytes with micro SD expansion. 229 for the 16 gigabyte version. Uh, the Verge actually asked Barnes Noble out loud, uh, "Who's going to buy the 8 gigabyte for 199? Right. Another 30 dollars. Yeah. They don't really know what's going on with that. Higher res display than the Kindle Fire at 1440 by 900. 1 1.3 gigahertz dual core uh, TI OMAP processor as as they're going out of business. I guess Nook's got a deal on that. Uh, then the Nook HD Plus. This is the nine inch one. 269 dollars for a nine inch 16 gigabyte 
1920 by 1280 display tablet. So this is a really low price, 1.5 gigahertz processor, and 299 for the 32 gigabyte. Barnes & Noble also took a dig at, at uh, Amazon saying, there's no ads on any lock screens. You don't have to pay any extra things. <laughs> when you buy this outright for these, these prices, you get, uh, you get no ads. Uh, they're also, both devices are a little thicker than the Amazon uh, competitors, but they're lighter. So it's, it's I guess, if you want a, a more a larger device, but it's it's lighter, this is your, your option. They ship at the end of October, hits the stores in November, and both units are going to hit the UK in lo late November, unlike the Kindle Fire. Amazon's only sending, selling the Kindle Fire HD 7-inch in the UK, but they're not sending out the 8.9. So Barnes & Noble is going to have a leg up there. Uh, for features, I mean, obviously, it's a very skinned version of Android. There's a catalog app. If you want to scrapbook something, you can do the little swipe gesture. It goes into a scrapbook. You can set up multiple accounts. Uh, you can ha you can do that via PC. It's definitely a really intriguing price Scrap point. Scrapbooking, the feature I've been waiting for. Well, the, it also shows <laughs> that Barnes & Noble is really thinking of this as a reader first. Sure. And then a media consumption device second, because that's their bread and butter, right? It's, it's, it's reading. Is that is that because of uh, are they trying to grab the Pinterest crowd? With That's that sort of totally thing? what scrapbook sounds like to me. Yeah. People yeah. say scrapbooking Pinterest. I like that. Thank you, Nook. This one ninety nine model. I also. I, I mean, I guess just the one ninety nine price sounds good to a lot of people. So they've decided to offer it. But really, a thirty dollar difference between a sixteen and a thirty two. I'm sorry, an eight gig and a sixteen gig version. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it would be sort of hard to understand why you wouldn't pony up for the more expensive one but then you even look at the hd plus for 269 for 16 gigs i mean that's just another 40 dollars on top of that it's a nice nice model and i i don't know about everybody else but i would rather something be lighter than thinner if i have to choose between the two because you're holding it right this mm -hmm. is a book that you're holding uh you don't mind if a book is i guess a little bit thicker you just don't want it to be so heavy that it's uncomfortable Natalia, what do you think about the price points of these devices going up against the Kindle Fire HD? Because these seem really competitive, although the the uh, I guess the ecosystem is a little different. Yeah, you know, it's 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 such a challenging question because I feel like they're kind of tripping over each other constantly. To get, I mean, it's, it's a little you know maybe this is a little better, that is a little better, depending on what you're looking for. You know, the challenge for me is always as a reader. You know, I'm I'm thinking more about the books that are available and sort of the reading experience. So I mean, the price point's one thing, but you know, if it's if it like like we're talking about the upgrade, you know, you're doubling you know your space for just a little bit more. I think it's sort of a little bit of pricing mind games here and. People need to think a little bit more about the features that they really want or don't want. I mean, personally, I'm always kind of like, what do these tablets really want to be? Um, I really, I have an old school uh, Kindle Touch. I just not even touch the the old school Kindle that looks like you know the pre paper white paper because I like my books to be books. So um, I think it's going to depend on what people are really using these for, and and of course there's the whole you know iPad line, which is much much more expensive. But you know, I guess my question is always, what is the user going to be doing with it, and maybe they need to look at it beyond just a price. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point because Nook has had the better hardware uh, when you look at mm -hmm. these types of, of tablets all the way through, but they haven't had the ecosystem. They ha haven't been perceived as having as many books, uh, even if they probably have most of the, of the titles that most people want. And they haven't had any kind of video or anything like that uh, until just now, until recently. Right. So I, it's a question of whether the Barnes & Noble ecosystem is going to grab people and they're going to want to take advantage of this because the first round of Nooks was always like, oh, this is the best Android tablet you can buy, even though it's yeah. not an Android tablet, really. It's a forked version of Android. Uh, I don't know that that's as compelling anymore. Yeah, look at the specs. I mean, they, they, it seems like Barnes & Noble is winning on the specs when it comes to this device. For sure. And if you want to do any expansion, your Nexus 7 can't do that. And I don't think the Kindle Fires, or the HD ones, allow you to have an expansion port either. So this is the kind of thing where I'm, if if they get that geek sector and we're all like, hey, wait, this is actually pretty cool. I can hack it or I can do more things with this device at a lower price point. You might be more likely to recommend it to go, hey, look, I have this one. Why don't you get this one too? Because this, it, it just, I'm just staring at this resolution, 1920 by 1280 on a nine inch display. For that price, it's just so cheap that I'm just, mm -hmm. I don't even need another tablet. Now I want one of these. So this is a, a real problem. You know, what's kind of interesting to me as, as I'm listening to you guys talk about this and, you know, about the specs being maybe better than the Kindle Fire HD. But as I'm watching the video that they have on The Verge, I'm noticing the lag 
uh, that's the associated touch the, on the touchscreen is really slow. So sometimes it doesn't even matter if the specs are better, if they don't, if the software isn't tuned, or there's something going on here because I'm watching and you know it touches. It's taking a while for it to respond, and that would destroy the experience for me. That would be enough for me to not want to get something like that, uh, even they, if the specs are better. They clarified in the, in, in the Verge article that that's pre-production software. And, okay. And that hardware is okay. finished, but the soft, software did lag a little. Yeah. The Barnes & Noble folks were telling David Pierce, who was in that video, pleading with him and telling him, listen, it's going to be smoother when it comes out, but the experience you, you're getting right now might be a little laggy at times. So in the video, they don't edit that out at all. They, they right. show you that it lags sometimes, but when it did work, uh, David was very clear about it, it worked really well. So if it does get smoothed out by October, so that they got a whole other month to go, to clean it up, it should hopefully wouldn't be as, as yeah. uh, buggy <laughs> right. as it appears yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that helps for sure. Speaking of buggy, uh, Intel's Paul Odellini talking about Windows 8 not being ready for release yet. Bloomberg reporting that it was a private employee event in Taipei, Taiwan yesterday, uh, where he was speaking to employees and said, and this is this is where headlines can can spin something out of control. He said uh, that Windows 8 isn't quite ready for release yet, but it's the right move to send it out because they can make improvements after it ships. Uh, so he wasn't bashing Windows. He was addressing probably some concerns with some of his employees saying, hey, I'm still noticing feature problems. I'm still noting bug bugs here. And he's like, you know what? It isn't. It isn't full yet. Uh, but they, they can fix that stuff after release. And this jives with things analysts have been saying. Michael Cherry at Directions on Microsoft has criticized uh, so the lack of software available for it. Uh, the Next Web had an article today about how Windows Store just passed 2,000 apps and that uh, they probably won't reach 10,000 by launch day on October 26th. Uh, Cherry also criticized lack of driver support, and that is something that damned Vista out of the gate. Uh, driver support problems could could be that that's the kind of thing that gets people really upset if they plug in their device and it doesn't work with a brand new operating system you're going to see a lot of complaints about that alex ghana an analyst at jmp securities uh wrote on september 13th that he is concerned about the amount of bugs that were available in the or that were present in the in the beta and the fine tuning necessary to get it working right so so, I mean, Microsoft says, look, we had 16 million active preview participants. Windows 8 is the most tested, reviewed, and ready operating system in Microsoft's history. Uh, how are we feeling about Windows 8? It wouldn't be the first OS to roll out with some fixes yet to be sure. made. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's very standard. I don't think anybody can say, well, I, the OS that I always choose is the one that's perfect right out of the gate. But... There is so much pressure on Windows 8 and particularly, you know, the the, uh, the 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 recent story that in the Windows Store app growth has kind of stagnated. That's, I think, really troubling because it just shows not lack of interest, but lack of momentum. It doesn't bother me on the desktop version of Windows 8, uh, the Intel-based version, uh, because there's plenty of Microsoft software out there. So if the Windows Store doesn't have a lot of titles, who cares? I may not use that thing anyway. But, but isn't the that tablet, mm -hmm. I think that could be a, a big issue. The thing that really like sh shot Microsoft in the foot with Vista was the lack of driver support. Now, if the, if, if the OEMs can't get things like printers working with a new Windows 8 machine, I mean, that's a real issue. I mean, this is it, if it breaks your your pre-existing uh, workflow at home or at, at work, that's where people start really pushing back. It's one thing that people will be adjusting to that new interface entirely, but when you can't have your devices talk to each other properly, that causes frustration. People get very upset, and if if Microsoft can't figure that out between now and October when it's released, again, have a whole other, other month, that's going to cause a much bigger issue than any UI thing, I think. Because, I mean, Vista was good underpinnings for, for, uh, for what was the thing, for 7, right? I don't think Microsoft wants 8 to be the underpinnings of anything. They want this thing to be a hit out of the gate. And also, that could be why they're coming out with their own their own hardware. That stuff is going to work no matter what. Mm. HPs might not. Maybe Dells won't. Or maybe you know Asus won't. Who knows? But if, if but the Surface will. Microsoft stuff will work from the beginning to end. If you can find the apps you want to use on it. Natanya, are you excited about Windows 8? I got to say, I, I've given up. Uh, I, I, uh, I've been using my Mac for, I, I had a Mac 10 years ago, and for a while, you know, I did the whole Windows thing. After Vista, I just was totally burned. But I think I think about this in terms of my parents. Like, you know, they want people to adopt this, right? And Vista was terrible for them. Seven was okay. 
it's already going to be hard enough to have everything so different and to have, like you said, the peripherals not working. If the one thing that my dad calls me most often about is that something's not working, the printer's not talking right to the computer, you know, the, the, the camera's not doing it right. And if that's an issue, you know, I think that people who are certainly 20, 30 years older than me just want it to work. And if it's not working, that's going to be a big pushback, I think, and a real potential problem. It is sort of the, uh, uh, the Star Trek effect. You know, every other Windows release is the good one. And and we're yeah. in the, we're in the, we're in the off release time, so I think a lot of people are are worried about that. The Verge pointed out Mary Jo Foley had a story up uh, a couple weeks ago that there are leaks of a code name Blue Windows update that would come out within the next year, and it's unclear whether this would be a, just a, a really massive service pack, which we're used to, uh, and, and a year would be about right, or if Microsoft is is doing a, a more dramatic move to get off of the of release schedule that they've been on for seemingly ever and move to a more of a of an apple like release schedule with point upgrades and maybe codename blue would be windows 8.1 or 8.5 yeah microsoft uh, mary jo made a good point of talking about how microsoft traditionally when it comes to their operating system sticks to cities and switching to blue is a completely different mm -hmm. way so either microsoft internally is changing the way they're thinking or it could just be a service pack or something like that where the point releases could exist i know that when when a uh, Microsoft recently did a press conference. They were talking about they were speeding up their, their refresh cycles. It might look more like Apple. Every year you might see something slightly different. Instead of calling it SP1, they might call it 8.1 like you're saying. But yeah. I'm thinking Blue is probably just, oh, it just sounds like it sounds like Azure. It sounds like there's going to be a lot of cloud stuff because that's what Microsoft's been doing with uh, Windows 8 so much anyway. Blue Sky Drive. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk. <laughs> We have more Google Maps, Apple Maps yeah. stuff. Yeah, both Ayaz and I thought, you know what? Today is going to be the day that we don't talk about Apple Maps, but today is not, not that day. day, in fact, because the story just gets thicker. Uh, sources did tell The Verge that Apple <laughs> severed ties on this multi year deal with Google Maps uh, voluntarily a year before the deal was actually up. So I guess they were sort of on an at-will basis with each other. This was apparently something that Google was made aware of prior to WWDC, which not only forced Google to start frantically working on its own standalone Google Maps app, but also remember the day, or the day, the, the week before WWDC, Google had its own Maps announcement, which was sort of like a, hey, Google Maps is still really cool and we're doing new stuff. Like aerial 3d photography and we've got these new street view backpacks and it was sort of like okay and they did strange they're doing street view like off the streets now right exactly. they did the coral reef thing for instance yeah and so it was sort of like at the time we all went okay well apple's gonna have a big announcement next week so this is sort of google just reminding people of the cool things that google is doing but it really had a lot specifically to do with maps because google knew <laughs> come you know in just a few short months we're not going to be in uh, iOS at all. Now, apparently, the sources that have talked to The Verge also say that the uh, Google iOS map that is being worked on is not even close to being ready. Um, several months out indicates probably won't be ready even by the end of this year. And, you know, it makes Apple, I guess, uh, potentially look like even, you know, the worst of the two companies in this situation. But also, the story is, is that... Uh, Apple was starting to get a little ruff ruffled feathers that the Android version of Google Maps was just clearly better than the iOS version. It wasn't sort of a Google Maps, this is a really good product no matter what uh, platform you're using. It was if you've got the Android version, you've got turn by turn, things are a little bit snappier, people are happy in general. If you've got iOS, still pretty good, but it's missing some key features. So Apple said, all right, well, now's the time. So they severed ties. I'm just not sure if they shouldn't have waited just a couple more product cycles. I mean, why not make Apple Maps awesome so that there's not the, uh, you know, you don't open the door for all of these people to point out why it's not awesome and why it's not ready and why the Statue of Liberty is missing if you look on Liberty Island and, and, and all that other stuff. Why was it so important to do that this year? So just When I was looking at this, I was thinking, okay, why would they do that? It seems like because there is that option to correct the maps that's built into the Maps app, mm -hmm. it seems like this is one giant beta test, or they're crowdsourcing this a bit. Because they took data from open source uh, maps, uh, open street maps, excuse me, mm -hmm. and they have partnerships with TomTom. Tom. They have a bunch of these things. And I think Apple was more concerned about the look, and they want to make sure that they can get either ads in there or different ties. 
iOS 6 and iPhone 5, that's going to be the gigantic, huge thing, right? Everyone who goes out, buys an iPhone 5, they have an experience with this Maps app, and they're going to complain, which is actually somewhat good news for Apple because it's go mm. they're going to be tested right away. Mm -hmm. They're going to go, this is the, these are the bugs, because no amount of testing is going to be the same. Because if you, if you, yeah, iPhone 5, you know, Cupertino is one thing. But if it's all around the world, and you're going, oh, my gosh, it's great in, in China. People are we've getting tons of emails defending Apple Maps in China. It seems to be the worst in the UK and really good in China. Yeah, really good in, in China and laughable in the United States. It just looks like it's... Is that a more global perspective on Apple's part to say, you know what, the biggest growth market for us is China? It could be. I have, this is all speculation at this point. Well, some of the data that both Apple and Google are pulling from China Maps are from a third party. So it's not as if Apple has some leg up that Google doesn't have access to. Uh, it does display a lot of uh, Chinese, uh, not only uh, uh, streets, but, uh, but actual specific places um, in Chinese characters, which Google Maps doesn't always do. So a lot of people say, hey, man, I mean, you got you to gotta cater to the, the local population. And many of them don't speak English, and they certainly don't read it. So there's a little bit of that going on. But, I, you know, they, they introduced Siri as Siri beta. And a lot of people said, yes. Very un-Apple-like. Yeah. Very un-Apple-like, but it still quieted the, you know, the, it would have been screams of disappointment had Siri been uh, this fully baked idea or at least rolled out that way. It was, hey, this is Siri. It's going to be awesome. She's still in beta right now, but she's already pretty cool. Help us make her better. If it had just been announced a little bit more like that rather than this maps is going to blow you away. It's like nothing Google has ever done before, which is how it was introduced at WWDC. It's all about the way, you know, the perception um, of the public. And it, it's uh, curiouser and curiouser why Apple decided to do it this way. And Tanya, have you been using Apple Maps? Do you have an iPhone? Yeah, I do. I actually uh, just finally switched over from an Android. Um, I had a Droid X forever, and it was a fantastic uh, fantastic turn-by-turn -turn navigation system, but uh, the phone side wasn't so great. So now I have the opposite problem. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I, you know, I wish... I think that you kind of touched on it briefly, but you said that it doesn't feel like something Apple would do and it doesn't feel as polished of an app. It doesn't feel as reliable. You know, driving around with my kids, it was one thing to be dangerous to look at the map and only be able to follow the little blue dot. But if I'm not getting accurate directions, that's also kind of scary. So yeah, I just hope, I hope, I hope it is kind of like a crowdsourced thing. I hope it gets better fast because, you know, I kind of pr prefer the way it was before. At least it was, you know, reliably simple. Well, Apple's released some pretty ugly products before I and mean, mobile me was a mess i mean they they, they fired the head of that guy, of, of that division they they threw it out for iCloud i mean apple has had it it seems like people seem to forget that apple does come out with occasionally some really horrible software products and people are like remember final cut when final cut got changed everyone was up in arms saying hey what did you do you just ticked off your entire user base you've changed everything so i, I don't really think it's that different for apple to do a screwy move like this cuz they have been doing it seems like maybe it's kind of like the microsoft thing every other iteration is good but the first version yeah. of maps is kind of uh this is uh this should say beta but i think if it said beta on it i think people would freak out and not use it all right let's take a quick break this episode of tech news today brought to you by fresh books if you're in business for yourself you love getting paid you hate doing the paperwork uh but think about all the time it takes to, to create all those invoices wouldn't you like to cut that down because uh, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to make those invoices if you want to get paid. Well, FreshBooks is here for you. Since 2004, uh, the online invoicing app has been saving people time, getting you paid faster. I use it myself for Sword and Laser. You can create invoices easily, email them out to your clients, and then do automated reminders. Now, you may immediately think, oh, that's great. The automated reminder for the client, make sure that they know, hey, your, your invoices do. It's good for you, too. If you got a bunch of invoices to keep track of, you may forget which ones are overdue. FreshBooks will take care of that. It's a personal assistant for your invoicing. They'll even send out a printed version of the invoice with a return envelope. It costs a little bit extra, $1.39 per invoice, uh, or you can buy them in bulk if you've got clients like that, but you don't have to do that. You can just send things out by email and folks can then pay you through that email. They can pay by credit card right there just by clicking a link. Uh, so go try it out. You can get 30 days of unlimited use of FreshBooks absolutely free. Uh, no limits. You get the features, the client. You can set up your staff, everything. Just sign up at FreshBooks.com. And if you would, tell them when they say, how'd you hear about FreshBooks? You heard about it on Tech News Today. Uh, again, if, uh, if you sign up right now, you get 30 days of unlimited use of everything in FreshBooks. So join 3.5 million FreshBooks users, including myself, who've been sending and paying invoices at FreshBooks.com. And we thank FreshBooks for their support of Tech News Today.
Uh, Tesla's back in the news. Uh, yeah. We, we, they had the big announcement of the charging stations yesterday. It but was the Tesla Supercharger Network. Yeah, not all good news now. No. In fact, I wonder if we heard about how great this whole Tesla Supercharger Network, that was the one that is how Tesla's going to roll out uh, solar-powered electric charging stations across California so that Tesla drivers can charge up in 30-minute increments um, as they make their long road trips. Well, later yesterday, Tesla filed updated paperwork with the SEC saying, okay, well, what we expected to generate in quarter three sales is almost half, actually, in reality. Oops. 44 to 46 million in Q3 sales is now the current estimate um, compared with almost 80 million the analysts had projected based on the company's production goals. So again, those were analyst predictions, but there's quite a discrepancy here. Uh, Tesla is not going to make nearly the amount of money that not only it expected, but others did um, as well. The filing says this, the Model S, which is the, the big kind of uh, consumer-friendly sedan that Tesla has been working on forever um, and has been delayed quite a bit, says the Model S is an all-new vehicle which we're producing with new employees using new equipment. As our main focus is on quality, we have methodically increased our Model S production at a rate slower than we had early anticipated. The company also says they're working with suppliers who are also experiencing delays and what can you really do about it? Now, of course, when you talk about cars and you talk about safety, it's like you you do want the the productions to be uh, stellar. Yeah, you know, it, it's better to it's be dangerous delayed enough to drive. Yeah. than than to not uh, be assembled correctly and to be safe. But Tesla is plagued with production delays. I mean, that's one of the first things I think of when I think of Tesla. I think of, oh yeah, they took over that Toyota plant in Fremont. You know, so it's good for the economy. But anybody I know, I actually know two people who have uh, ordered uh, Model S uh, cars. And, I mean, they should have gotten their cars well over a year ago. And it's like there isn't even really an update. Um, I think they're rolling out something like, you know, 200 rather than 400 at this point. And then they say, oh, we should be up into the thousands by next year. But their current track record doesn't really show for a ramping up of production. It kind of shows that, hey, these are really good ideas. Um, anybody who's been able to look at and test the Model S says this is a really amazing car. But they're not rolling out anything uh, that's, that's, that's keeping up with demand, I guess. Um, and, and it's kind of showing people that, that, uh, that they're serious. Uh, they have a federal grant um, that, uh, that came in from the Department of Energy. It's a $465 million loan. Uh, they have used that up. They need more money. They're planning to raise more money via a stock offering of an additional 4.3 million shares. Um, the underwriter is going to be Goldman Sachs. They have a 30-day option to buy almost 700,000 additional shares. So it, Tesla's trying to figure things out, right? Um, we did get an email, though, that I think is kind of funny um, that's in response to the whole thing about yesterday where it's like, okay, Tesla's going to at least roll out these electric charging stations. They're really thinking about people who are using electric cars on you know at least a day-to-day -day basis or at least on long distance trips uh, this is from meredith and she says the tesla story made me laugh out loud there is no way i would drive a car that forced me to stop every three hours to charge for 30 minutes first who only drives 60 miles per hour on a road trip the speed limit on most freeways is 70 and you know people go over that anyway i infer that at those speeds i'd probably have to start to recharge more often than every three hours let's say every two and a half hours seriously and she goes on to say she lives in Atlanta. She has a sister in Florida. She takes long trips regularly. She wouldn't want something like the Model S, even though this is supposed to be the big consumer-friendly Tesla car that's going to change all our minds about electric vehicles. I don't know. What do you guys think? Sometimes I, I worry about this whole Tesla thing. Natalia, you're out in North Carolina. Do you do uh, a lot of driving like she describes? We do. Yeah, my in-laws are on the coast, so, you know, we would have to actually dr stop just shy of their house. <laughs> and wait 30 minutes it's to a, charge just to make it. Huh? And wait 30 minutes. And my, my son, he's six, but he's a total absolute car geek. I mean, he's watched every every episode of Top Gear UK that there is. And he just, he's so, like, aloof about the whole Tesla thing because he's he finds it fascinating, but he's just like, it's not going to happen. So that's, that's his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, right now Tesla's 
they have a really interesting idea in a really ugly market. And when your lowest price car is fifty thousand dollars, that's kind yeah. of a hard sell already. And that's like stock version, right? You I mean, a souped-up version of the Model S is more like a hundred thousand. Starts off at forty-nine nine. Like, yeah, that's starting. So I don't even know what what doesn't it come with air conditioning. I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> or a seat. <laughs> you actually just walk. That's Mer sure. Meredith, also not polluting. Meredith, you're not in the target market. Is what we're, <laughs> what we're saying. Uh, this, I think, what what Elon Musk was trying to do is show that electric cars can be fancy. That they mm -hmm. they don't have to be you know these these weird geeky things like the original uh uh prius or the uh what was the one that only had like uh, uh, uh very small wheels in the back uh, oh the the insight yeah the original oh, yeah. In, right, the original right. insight Honestly. he was trying to say mm -hmm. hey they can be sexy they can be sports cars and it's targeted at city dwellers who don't need to drive very far uh who just you know are going to tool their sports car around the cities higher income folks there uh, I, I do think that it's worrying that it's taking so long for Tesla to come out with their models, uh, and, and, and that is concerning. But uh, they're, they're trying to bra blaze a trail, like, like with SpaceX, like with the asteroid mission. That's what Elon Musk likes to do. He, he likes to go far out on the edge and see if he can succeed with something crazy. Yeah, but with space, there's not a lot of ton of competition. I mean, General Motors is having a hard time making cars, and that, that's what they've been doing for the longest time. Tesla's a relatively new company, and trying to get into that market this is really hard. Again, the trying to get in the space market isn't hard. Well, okay. what's the competition? <laughs> it's you versus NASA. NASA is not doing anything. And the Soviet Union. I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard. Like eight, That's what the reason there's no competition. There's no consumer issue there. I'm talking about like the mm. the, the economic downturn is not exactly going to be. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm I live in this city because I want to be closer to work, and I'm going to buy the fifty thousand dollar car. Instead of getting you know a little, no, it's tar it's targeted at people with disposable income. It, yeah, right? and it's I just a, don't a niche know if, if this is the right time for this kind of vehicle. Like I, I'm just afraid this is going to be way ahead of its time, and it's going to be killed, and then someone else is going to come up with it. The Model S has been perking around for five years or more. I mean, it's if if it's ahead of its time, it, I don't I don't it's think it's time, ahead I think, of its time. I think its time is in ten years when it's twenty thousand. I think it's behind its time, frankly. It's late. It's somewhere around the clock. I don't. <laughs> Let's talk about some 3D printers because yeah. there's there's more and more 3D printers all car. the time. Uh, uh, MakerBot and the RepRap designs that are DIY out there, those are extrusion-based 3D printing. Uh, but a story on Wired today about a new version that is more like professional 3D printers, stereolithography devices where ultraviolet light cures incredibly thin layers of resin to create objects that are on par with manufactured goods. They don't have the rough exteriors that needed to be st sanded those are expensive uh they're like ten thousand dollars or more so a company called form one was created actually a company's called form labs their printer is called form one uh by three mit grads david craner an electrical engineer maxim lebowski an engineer and former project lead on the fab at home project and nathan linder who previously co-founded an r&d center for samsung in israel have uh come up with an affordable Lithography, stereolithography type device that uses ultraviolet light. They got backing from some big names, Eric Schmidt, Joy Ito, Mitch Kapoor of Lotus fame. They only, they only spent $500,000, though, and they've got a fully functional prototype. They're launching it on Kickstarter. Uh, they already sold out of the first 25, which you could get for $2,299, but you can still buy them for more money, uh, $2,499 and up. In fact, you pay more based on the order of contribution. They'll ship in February. They, they're fairly certain they're, they're going to meet their target. And they can print objects that are 4.9 by 4.9 by 6.5 inches with layers that are just 25 microns thick. Now, people were getting very excited about the new MakerBot we talked about last week because it is 100 microns thick. So this is uh, much less, a quarter of the thickness in the layers. And that means it can be used in production parts uh, for small runs. It could do jewelry casting. Uh, it, it can come up with all kinds of, of real detailed looking. I, I saw a lot of tabletop game pieces with real detailed, uh, you know, facial contours and, 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 and details, lots of detailed details. They look really good is what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so I, I, the resin's going to be costly. They're, they're estimating about $149 a liter. Although they do say that if you support them on Kickstarter, uh, they'll guarantee one liter per month for $129 for the life of the printer. Uh, and the design on this thing is just gorgeous. It's it's uh, kind of like an orange cube at the, at the top, which is meant to keep out ultraviolet light because it uses UV light to create the layers. And this uh, anodized aluminum base that Wired called it the MAC 
uh, to MakerBot's Apple II. I'm not sure if we're quite that far in the 3D printing space, but for a couple thousand dollars, this thing's going to look good in your office. I love the whole jewelry thing. Yeah. I have never really thought about that side of 3D printing. The fact that you can you can make beautiful, and, and well, not custom in the way that something handmade would be custom, but stuff that is sort of perfect in a way. I mean, diamonds are next. MakerBot diamond. They making. print out diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> just and, the, leave, and the value of diamonds goes through the floor. I guess I just, I've, <laughs> I've thought about these 3D printers as being something that's, oh, you need a replacement part. Or, yeah, you want maybe like a, you know, some sort of like a cool figurine or there's, there's, there's a lot of. Like really, a kid's toy. Yeah, yeah. Interesting uses for it. But um, I got to think outside the box a little bit more. Yeah. This can do a lot. Natanya, what do you, what do you think of this 3D printer? 3D printers make me giddy. I just, it's, me I see too. so much, you know, I think, I think being a, a geek is like, I, like you said, the, the tabletop stuff. I have so many friends that are game designers and they have to, I, I don't know if it's necessarily, a, I'm guessing it's still going to be cheaper than having to take all this stuff to China and get, you know, subpar stuff back to have the control, to be able to make, you know, your, your own it, it, things for your D and D table that look exactly like you want them to jewelry, anything that kind of comes alive like that. Just, I mean, I can't imagine being a kid and having access to something like this, you know, looking at my kids and thinking, you know, in 10 years, this is probably going to be in our house. Oh, yeah. And it sort of right now looks like a cross between a, you know, an, an, uh, an apple cube and a popcorn machine. Yeah, <laughs> pop, yes, uh, an air popper. Yeah, the, the orange, the orange color kind of looks like uh -huh. those little popcorn machines. But, um, you know, it just, it seems like there's so much possibility here that could be extremely innovative. And, and yeah, some of it is replacement stuff that you could, wouldn't have to do. Um, but, you know, I love, I love baking cakes and there's like, I want really cool cookie cutters. Well, I could design something that I could never find and, and make that, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I think I saw uh, one last week too in my Flipboard uh, stream that there was actually one big enough to print rooms out of. So now you're all, not only getting the small scale, you know, really, really thin, but you're getting 3D printers that can actually make houses. So how that's going to change manufacturing and then sort of the, the layman's access to creativity is going to be pretty exciting to see. Every time I see one of these printers, I keep thinking of every time I need a case for one of my devices or I need a little stand mm. or I need something this kind of like, I need something that's about this tall. I, I just I have to look around in my, my boxes and hopefully I can find, find something and make something out of like washers or something. Maybe I'll make it work. But to be able to print out something exactly that I want, that would be something that I'd, I'd probably be messing around for days. Like, okay, this case isn't right. Okay, well, maybe if, if I want my Mac sitting up here, I can make its own feet. Instead of having to go, okay, who makes this now? And is it going to be available? Is it in the color I like? Is this? And, and the amount of research I end up doing is probably amount, the amount of time I could take to design something and make it myself. And I'm, every time I see this, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to design my own case for anything now. I mean, you think about uh, the Commodore 64, uh, the Atari 2600, those were... You know, those were from two hundred dollars up to a thousand dollars. We're getting to that price for three D printers, and and that was a lot more money back then than it is now. So we're pretty much on par with the ability to bring this in your home. We, I, we've moved from the Heathkit days uh, for three D printing and into the uh, the early personal computing days. Very exciting. That's I think this is one of the most exciting things going on in technology. And soon people can complain that it doesn't work with the Windows 8 machines because yeah, exactly. there's no drivers. <laughs> or or they're going to get so cheap and the ink or the, the resin is going to get so expensive that it'll be the same thing that you deal with when you're getting your printer and your color oh, ink. It's like, oh, my God. can't wait to grouse about this. That's how yeah. cheap it's going to be. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's uh, finish up really quickly. Uh, what's going on with Kim.com? He has escaped uh, deportation. He's, it seems like he's escaping trial, and, and now he's launching a new product? Yeah, while he's running, apparently he was like shooting a video at the same time because he posted a video on YouTube showing off Megabox. Uh, Megabox is that music service, and there's a lot of details that are actually seen in the video. Uh, it looks as though artists and consumers can create separate profiles. Artists can share as much music as they like. Megabox would allow artists to sell their own music and keep 90% of the revenue. The video shows off an exclusive artist section. Now, the artists shown in that section are the Black Keys, Rusco, or Rusco, Two Fingers, and Will I Am. Now, TornFreakAss.com if these are launch partners, and he couldn't say if they are or not possible or it could just be a mock-up we don't know that and the way megabox makes money is that you download an app called mega key mega key app works like an ad blocker but it replaces a percentage of ads with mega ads so if you don't install the app you got to go buy the music so it's kind of this little weird thing uh and the idea is that artists will share as much music as they want because they're gonna get paid for this not a whole lot uh, about like timing when it's coming other than soon 
Uh, it looks interesting. It's got a really clean design. He's just taunting the industry. The industry is not going to cooperate. They're going to try to squash this as fast as possible because it's personal. They don't even care if it's a good idea or not. Uh, this, is, this, this is like tongue wagging to me. Tony, do you think this is already dead because of the uh, all the hatred for dot com already by the industry? Yeah, I think that in a combination of it seems like we're kind of dealing in a very saturated market. I'm already like, am I going to be on Pandora or Spotify or am I going to go? I mean, it it seems like it's a different take on that. But I, I are we going to put our music another place? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. And are we are we going to trust him to do it? <laughs> Will the servers be up tomorrow? Yeah. I don't know. Or seized. All right, uh, take a quick right. break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Gazelle.com. Uh, if you're wanting to save up some money for your 3D printer, you might want to get rid of some old gadgets you're not using anymore. And Gazelle is the simplest and fastest way I've ever found to get rid of your gadgets. It's almost mindless. You just go and you put in your device. You can pick from a picture and you, they'll give you a quote. You've got that quote for 30 days, so you don't have to make a decision right away to send it off. You can wait until you buy your new thing if you want. And then when you're ready to send it, they'll print that, give you a shipping label. They'll pay for the shipping. Sometimes they'll even send you a box, and then you'll send it off. I dropped mine off today. Uh, my, my money will come as soon as they get it in their hot little hands. They'll pay you by PayPal. They'll pay you by check, or they'll pay you by Amazon gift certificate. So go check it out. Uh, if you don't, if you're thinking, oh, I want to get rid of my old gadgets, but I don't want the hassle and the pain of going through trying to sell them, there's no hassle and pain with Gazelle. Go to gazelle.com, G A Z E L L E.com. Get a quote, lock it in today, uh, and get some cash for your new gadgets. Gazelle.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. What's on the calendar, Sarah? Oops. Well, Tom, I'm. It was sorry about that. <laughs> that was apparently the wrong one. Well, no, it's random. Oh, so it okay. actually all kind of worked out. Uh, tomorrow, if this, then that, ifttt.com is forced to remove those Twitter triggers to comply with Twitter's new API policies that everybody loves so much. Um, also, tomorrow is Intel Windows 8 event. I can't find out for the life of me when it is. It's just when it when it is. It's all day. It's random, remember? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's all day. It starts it's all day. It's 24 hours. Calendar day. Right. Yeah, you know, that's a very good point. I looked all over the place this morning. It's just tomorrow. Yeah, sometimes. Which is already, it's the tomorrow day already, depending on where in the world you are. So I guess it's in the U.S. Also tomorrow, Simple TV. Uh, this is the $150 DVR for your iPhone, your iPad, your Roku, or the web is shipping. I'm very excited about this. Anybody I, else going to get one? I started this, so yep. I, I should be getting one. You're going to get one to, well, shipping tomorrow, so... Maybe sometime this week. And my iPhone 5, I know no one cares, but one of us cares. She's sitting in this seat. Um, was scheduled to come on Friday, and now is supposed to be delivered end of day tomorrow, even though it's still in Seoul, Korea. Oh, wow. I don't gonna know how that's going to happen. Fast. But, if, teleporter in Seoul, Korea. but if it happens tomorrow, I'm going to be pretty excited. <laughs> tomorrow see. on calendar. Sarah's excited. <laughs> Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got a couple of, of emails from folks about the Einstein uh, thing. Dave, the psychologist at, uh, I'm sorry, Dave Broadbeck, the associate professor and chair of the Department of Psychology at Algoma University, uh, wrote in and said he is more excited about the coming website that will have slices of Henry Molison's brain. Uh, Molison had area CA1 of his hippocampus lesioned in the early 50s to control epilepsy. They did not know at the time uh, that the HP is very important in consolidating episodic memories. When Canadian psychologist Brendan Milner of the Montreal Neurological Institute at McGill tested H on his episodic memory, he was found to have none past the operation. She had to introduce herself to him each time she worked with him each day. He could learn stuff, but he would not remember learning it. The discovery was very important to the development of cognitive neuroscience. Brenda actually was a guest on an early futures in biotech with Mark Peltier and uh, Dave Broadbeck. Uh, and he says she's a big Montreal Canadiens fan and then breaks down into Go Habs references. But uh, interesting <laughs> stuff there. Also, uh, a couple of people wrote in and point out something I did not realize. I, I made an off-the-cuff remark that Einstein had devoted, donated his brain to science, just assuming. But you know what happens when you assume? You get correction emails from everyone in the audience. Well, actually... And, uh, apparently, Einstein's brain was stolen by the doctor that performed the autopsy. Maybe not stolen, but he took it without anyone really giving him permission. Acquired. Uh, Thomas Harvey <laughs> understood the significance of Einstein's brain, so he stuck it in a jar and took it home. The whole story of how he kept it in a mayonnaise jars for years and how he drove around the country with it in his car is kind of funny. So thanks to everybody who wrote in and pointed that out. 
Got another email from Nalteras, who says, I work for an MSO. Uh, TiVo hardware is twice and even three times as expensive for MSOs to purchase than any other vendor set-top boxes, making ROI too high. Add in the chronic compatibility and video on demand issues, and this box is not a good fit for cable providers to issue. Yes, TiVo has many compelling features. I truly enjoy it, but in the end, it's a retail device. Hopefully, someday there will be a low cost, high spec, and user friendly UI unit brought into market that will meet both the needs of MSOs and the features for customers. No, it's not going to happen. Uh, right. The MSOs could could go halfway and uh, and actually make it easier. Meet the needs of MSO and the customers. These yeah. seem totally at, at odds. So I'm depressed. Are you too depressed to read the next email? I thought we read it already. Uh, oh, we did, didn't we? Yeah. So, uh, no. So don't read that one. That's, a, a, that's so the one yes. with the Tesla car. Yes, he is depressed. <laughs> He's just too depressed. Because that would be weird. <laughs> that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching and submitting in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Over 10,000 people in there helping us uh, pick the stories of the day. We appreciate everybody in there and all, of, all the moderators in there who do all the hard work keeping it working. Natanya Barron, a pleasure having you on Tech News Today. I hope you'll come back soon. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Let folks know where they can find the Geek Mom stuff you're doing. Yeah, we are at uh, geekmom.com. We're part of the Wired blog network. So wired.com forward slash geekmom is also where you can find us. It's worth reading, geekmom.com. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with an all-new episode in Paul, Spain, who's from New Zealand, not Spain. We'll see you then. <laughs>